Hi, my name is Vaughn Cooper and I'm a professor at the University of Pittsburgh in the School of Medicine. I'm an evolutionary biologist and a microbiologist and a co-founder of our Center for Evolutionary Biology and Medicine. One of our major goals in the center is to communicate how evolution is important for medicine, and this is especially true for this ongoing COVID epidemic. The goal of this short video is to explain some key features of the evolution of this novel coronavirus known as SARS-CoV-2. So the first question on most of our minds is, where did this virus come from? And what let the cat out of the bag and caused this epidemic? To help explain, let's first consider a family tree of cats. I'm showing a family tree of cats as an example. This is an evolutionary family tree or a phylogeny, which is a scientific model of relatedness based on the complete genomes of these different cat species. This figure indicates a series of nested groupings among them. At the far left, we see that the lineage that gave rise to these big cats diverged from the domestic house cat lineage about 12 million years ago. Over on the right, notice the snow leopard and the tiger are actually sister species that diverge from one another about 3.4 million years ago, meaning that snow leopards are more closely related to tigers than they are to leopards. I found this pretty cool. In any case, we can use the same rationale to infer genetic relationships between different kinds of viruses isolated from different host animals. Now here is the latest family tree of coronaviruses, including the cause of COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. The orange arrow points to this virus. You may note that it's part of a closely related cluster that includes the cause of the SARS epidemic between 2002 and 2003. Together, this group at the top is known as the severe acute respiratory syndrome related coronaviruses. Now I've highlighted all the coronaviruses known to cause human disease. At the bottom, here are several coronaviruses that cause a common cold. Their nearest neighbors are viruses found in rodents, mice, and rats. But above are the other coronaviruses that cause severe epidemics in the last 20 years, MERS, SARS, and now SARS-2. All of these are very closely related to viruses isolated from bats. You may note also see this creature, the masked palm civet, in which a close relative of the original SARS epidemic virus was isolated. However, the civet certainly was infected by a bat relatively recently beforehand. So all of the severe coronaviruses trace their very recent ancestry to bats, but it's possible they passed through another animal immediately prior to infecting humans. So what makes bats so special as hosts of viruses that cause human epidemics? The first explanation is that one fifth of all animals are bats. So this makes them a pretty sizable and mobile reservoir of viruses that could infect other mammals. The second is that bats have evolved a pretty amazing range of metabolic capacities that enable their success as fast flying predators and their long lives. Bats actually can live for several decades, so they have exceptional defenses against byproducts of their high metabolism. The last is that their antiviral responses, named ironically through a pathway known as sting, are dampened so that their immune responses to viral infections are measured and not as damaging to the bat. They can tolerate and manage viral infections better than we can. Okay, so we know that this novel virus came from bats like the other two coronavirus outbreaks. Is it involving in humans right now? And as many of you may have seen on social media, are there now two strains which differ in their virulence or perhaps their ability to be controlled by uh, vaccines or other medicines? Well, yes, the virus is indeed evolving, but not just in two strains. In fact, this novel coronavirus is now a population of hundreds of thousands of cases and these viruses are no longer identical. In fact, they began to diversify as the epidemic in China began to spread. These changes have been captured and analyzed beautifully by the group who built and run nextstrain.org, which provides near real-time visualization of genetic differences evolving within epidemics, like influenza, Ebola, and now COVID-19. 
On this graph, the x-axis is time. Over the first four months of this epidemic, genetic diversity has randomly arisen by mutations, and we can plot their accumulation over time. On the y-axis, the number of mutations detected out of the nearly 30,000 nucleotide bases of this RNA genome of this coronavirus. They're accumulating, on average, at a rate of about 23 changes, less than one in a thousand per year. On average, any two viral isolates differ from the initial isolate sequence in China by about six mutations right now. This may seem like a lot, but thanks to the good folks at Nextstream, we can compare these differences with seasonal influenza, the one we ought to be vaccinated against each year. This is a plot of the genetic diversity in just one gene of the major influenza A strain, H3N2, over the last seven, seven years. It's evolving even faster despite a fault smaller genome. So there are two reasons. Human immunity continues to select against common flu strains, requiring the virus to evolve. And also, the mutation rate of influenza is higher because it doesn't have a proofreading function in its genome, which coronaviruses do. So with all this genetic variation evolving within these viruses, we wonder if they're changing their functions or perhaps becoming harder to fight off or treat. If we plot this family tree of coronaviruses a different way, and we label each genome by its country of isolation here in different colors, we see that viruses are generally isolated by distance, meaning that as new infections arise in new regions within hu with human migration, they randomly acquire subtle differences, and these differences are shared by community spread. For example, this red cluster corresponds to viruses isolated from the US and Canada, and they trace from strains that originally originated in China, which are labeled in purple. However, there's no evidence that these differences affect the rate of COVID transmission or their severity. These are just chance differences associated with local epidemics, and these regional associations are disappearing as humans move around and does the virus. So to conclude, up to this point, in March 2020, most of the genetic variation in the SARS-2 coronavirus is randomly associated with different geographic regions. We call this variation the founder effect, where random differences in a founding population cause organisms in different regions to have slightly different makeup. So a big question that many people are rightly asking now is what will happen in the future for the novel coronavirus? There's a theory that pathogens obey a trade-off between virulence, how sick they make you, and transmissibility, which is their probability of causing a new infection and making new offspring. The idea is that more severe virulent pathogens might make more offspring in one host, but since that host might be bedridden, they may have less chance for transmission. On the other hand, less virulent pathogens might allow the host to be more susceptible and interact with more susceptible hosts so they would have a greater chance of being transmitted. The key to this trade-off model is whether virulence affects transmission. As you probably know, transmission is definitely not limiting for this novel coronavirus. In fact, it's accelerating. I show an example of transmission where one infected person infects two other people. This represents a reproductive number for the virus of two. To slow an epidemic, we need to reduce this number below one so that each infection on average produces less than one new infection. Current estimates show that this number, R0, is significantly greater than one in nearly all regions except for the severely quarantined regions of China and perhaps also in Japan and Denmark. So there's currently little or no selection for milder or more transmissible forms of the novel coronavirus and there likely won't be for quite some time. Just as some other evidence, here are two recent tweets from experts Carl Bergstrom of the University of Washington and Trevor Bedford from Fred Hutch. They agree that SARS-2 is unlikely to evolve to become more transmissible. Carl relies on his decades of experience as a theoretical modeler of epidemics, and Trevor, who helped build these beautiful next strain plots of viral evolution, points to lots of experience with seasonal influenza, which has not evolved to become more or less transmissible in the last 50 years. Still, 
we in the field are still looking for such changes. Now there's one example that is currently under peer review that shows that a lineage of viruses isolated from Singapore during the early weeks of the epidemic evolved the deletion of a gene involved in virulence. This gene is known to be under selection in other coronaviruses, like the original SARS epidemic virus during transmission from animals to humans. While this deletion affects function, it's unclear of its broader effects on human infections. But these are the sorts of changes we might be looking for in months to come. To summarize, I hope I've shown you that the novel coronavirus is indeed evolving, like all viruses and indeed all organisms do. However, it's not likely that changing in any significant way to affect its virulence. It means very virulent and transmissible and seems likely to remain so for quite some time. If it did eventually evolve al altered transmissibility, more infections would be required over more time and perhaps in response to selection that limit human interactions or vaccination. For now, evolution is our friend because it helps us do better genome epidemiology. The real value of these genetic differences is they allow us to follow the virus and learn ultimately how to contain it. I wanna thank you for your attention and point you to these terrific references that I've used to put together this video. Thank you.